On Tech News Today, the Chinese government is putting police stations inside internet companies to keep them in line. Plus, you'll hear from a journalist who actually rode the Lexus hoverboard, and Facebook patents the idea of approving bank loans based on who your friends are. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, August 5th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. My name is Mike Elgin, and our co-anchor today is ZDNet contributing writer Kevin Tofel. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Good to be here, Mike. Thanks. So glad you're here. Now, yesterday we talked about the new Windows 10 Cloud Book, uh, and the, the, it's a line, actually, uh, from Acer. Very inexpensive devices, cheaper than Windows itself in some cases. <laughs> and so it's, you know, our the uh, journalist we had on was very bullish on this category, but you, not so much. You're saying it's not a Chromebook killer, and can you tell us why that is? Well, sure. I mean, if, if people just bought Chromebooks solely on the price, and a lot of them do factor in the price of the, of the low cost laptops, then I'd say, okay, there's a, there's a situation there. It's a Chromebook killer. But the thing is windows and Chrome OS are totally different beasts. I said on uh, Twitter yesterday, calling these cloud books, a, uh, a Chromebook killer is like calling a Volkswagen bus, a rally car killer. They're different types of products, totally different experiences. One is much lighter. And I would say simpler to use, um, less features of course, and one is a little more complex and has a lot of legacy stuff and so on. I'm not saying one is better than the other because that's a personal choice, but frankly, you know, it's not just about price. And, and I, Pretty sure, you know, that you use Chromebooks, Mike. I think you know what I'm talking about, but so many people still don't get the simplicity factor of a Chromebook. Yeah, I think that's true, and uh, I can't speak personally to the to the new category because I haven't tried them. I haven't even seen one yet. I'm intimately familiar with the Chromebook and Chrome OS devices, and I love them. I think they're fantastic, but I think we're getting to the point now, Kevin, where the hardware is getting so cheap in some cases, and this is true with smartphones, with, with desktop systems, with laptops and, and all-in-ones and all the rest, that I think people are increasingly enjoying the luxury of buying a device just for one or two apps. So, for example, if somebody wants to run you know, a suite of uh, Microsoft apps or something specific that is a Windows application, they might buy one of these for 170 bucks or 200 bucks or whatever it is. And, you know, it's, it's uh, peanuts compared to what people used to pay for anything that would run Windows. And likewise, for a Chromebook, you can get a really inexpensive Chromebook if you want to have a very secure system, which I would recommend, actually, for doing email and browsing the Internet. I mean, that's where you get in trouble. You get something in email, you click on a link, you go to a website, or you're just clicking around on the web, something downloads, a Trojan is installed, it takes over your machine. None of that stuff happens with a Chromebook. So if you're going to be doing your, your emailing and your web surfing on a Chromebook with other applications running on whatever it is you like to use, no matter what that is, whether it's an OS 10 device or Windows device or whatever, you're going to be a lot more secure. So I think that the norm will take longer than the industry uh, will. And, you know, I think people should think about that. Think about the fact that you can have a desk full of devices for pennies, and it's it's really a, kind of a great world. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, you know, at the end of the day, it's great that we have these choices, you know, because there isn't one device that fits all. And if you need to use Office or you need to use Windows apps, you can go do that for $170. If you don't, then, you know, you can spend $170 or a little more and have a safe, secure, sandboxed environment that, you know, is easy to update. It's never taken me more than two minutes to get the OS refreshed. Um, so again, the consumer wins in the end. Exactly, and there's choice for everyone. If you don't want an inexpensive device, you know where the Apple Store is. So <laughs> good luck with that. So our top story today, China's slide into a new totalitarianism under President Xi Jinping accelerated today when the Chinese government announced plans to station police officers inside major tech companies. Each big Chinese internet company, including Tencent and Alibaba and many others, will get a network security office inside the company. 
The purpose of the move is to deepen censorship and prevent, quote, subversion, unquote, according to a senior security official quoted by the Financial Times. But a Chinese professor also quoted by the paper said the real goal is to, quote, create an intimidating atmosphere inside the companies themselves, unquote. Kevin Tofel, what's going on in China? Where, where are they going with this? You know, Mike, I kind of get the sense of desperation in China. They keep trying to lock down the Internet more and more there. This is a, just another of many examples <laughs> recently. And, and I do think it will create intimidating, intimidating atmosphere inside these companies. The thing is, I said this before, the Internet has made the world so much smaller in that we can communicate with just about anyone, anywhere. There's apps to do anything. You can buy products from around the world, have them shipped to your home. I don't see how China can continue to fight that. And that's why I say I get this sense of desperation. Maybe they keep thinking they can, but at the end of the day, it's just not going to happen. At some point, um, I, I think these walls are going to break down, at, at least from a, you know, a virtual standpoint. You know, it's hard to tell exactly how much there is in China in terms of threats to the order or for the ruling class of, uh, of, of uh, people in, in power currently, uh, or how much of this is just old school paranoia. I mean, uh, Xi Jinping is, is this, this dude is like right out of the uh, Communist Party rule book. He grew up in the, within the Communist Party and, you know, cut his teeth when China was very, very repressive. And, uh, and they sort of tried to liberalize depending on who the leader was at any given time. They've, of course, modernized. They're rapidly modernizing. They're very capitalistic in many ways. A and yet this guy is uh, old uh, an old school commie, basically, who, who you know, who wants to do purges and all the rest, presumably, and uh, comes from a world where, you know, you don't tolerate any dissent at all. And like you say, you know, in the new world, people can say whatever they want, uh, but it's going to be a little harder to do that when there are cops inside your building. Clearly, these police officers or whoever they are who are going to be stationed inside these companies, they're not going to be actually monitoring what's going there's no need for them to physically be in there for any reason other than to be physically there so people are reminded as they're going off to their meeting that okay there's government officers with guns in the building it won't take them more than five minutes to arrest us if we decide to allow so-and-so to say whatever so it's it's a weird uh, weird situation that china's got they're trying to play both sides of the fence and they've been doing it for many years where they're kind of like a, a, a capitalist democracy in some ways and kind of like a totalitarian dictatorship in others. So we'll see if they can continue to pull it off. And by the way, they have their imitators. Uh, Vladimir Putin loves these guys. He thinks they've really got it right. So whatever happens in China ends up happening in Russia at some point. More news coming right up. But first, let's talk about great food. Blue Apron is one of our sponsors today. And, of course, you know I love great food. And I also love exotic food. I love food from all over the world. I was thinking this morning about what type of food would I be willing to, you know, if I had to choose one style of food for the rest of my life and choose no other, I don't think I could make that decision. I absolutely love Mexican food and Latin American food. I love you know, Mediterranean food. I love African food. I love all kinds of different types of food. And that's exactly what you get with Blue Apron. It just happens. All you do is sign up and you get food from all over the world. But this food isn't just uh, ordinary food. It's fresh ingredients, seasonal, directly from farms and family run purveyors. This is really high quality food that they, they lovingly package for you, shows up in a box. You just use these simple step-by-step -step in instructions. And if you're watching the video, you saw a quick shot. This is their promotional material of, of a family putting this together. This is a great thing for a family to do together because it teaches kids how to cook. Now, even after they leave the house, uh, I've got two kids who, who have left the house. And they, you know, the truth is one of my kids tends to gravitate toward mac and cheese or frozen pizza or something like this. But with Blue Apron, he can make really super delicious food, low calorie, takes about 30, 35 minutes to prepare, super easy to prepare as well, even though there are no shortcuts, there are no, there are no corners cut in terms of the quality of the outcome. It's just that they've done all the hard work for you. They figured out exactly how to make it, and they tell you exactly. They hold your hand through the entire process. So even if you're not a skilled cook, you can make better than restaurant quality food in 30, 35 minutes. It's really an astonishing service, and you've got to try. Their, this week, they got crispy catfish with Sicilian eggplant caponata. They also have a summer corn and bell pepper pizza with taleggio cheese and fresh thyme. This is really, you know, when, they, when I say fresh thyme, they'll have a little bag with a fresh 
thyme leaves in there. This isn't dried, you know, stuff that you get out of the, one of those shakers from the grocery store. This is fresh stuff right off of the plant. So you're going to love this. You've got to try it, and you can try it absolutely free. Blue Apron is a better way to cook, and you can check out this week's menu and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. Seriously, I want you to try this, two meals free. And just go to blueapron.com slash twit to get your two meals. And shoot me a note, uh, tnt at twit.tv, and let me know how you like the two meals that you tried. I'm, I'm really curious to know how much you loved it, because I know you will. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Today. Well, in, uh, in our second story here today, Facebook had planned to change what it does with the user data from people using their mobile apps. But after huge pressure from companies that make games and apps, Facebook changed its tune. Dean Takahashi is the lead writer for Games Beat at Venture Beat and joins us now. Welcome to the show, Dean. Hello, Mike. Now, Dean, what was the policy change that Facebook had planned to implement on November 4th? Well, they uh, wanted to uh, change uh, how they uh, passed along the information about users that they got uh, from Facebook mobile ads. Uh, they usually passed along the, the device information about a user uh, to uh, a third party company, measurement company, um, like one called Chava or AppsFlyer. Um, uh, these companies would. Um, uh, take the data, uh, you know, figure out what was important about it, and pass it on to uh, game publishers and app publishers. And those app publishers, uh, they would they would use that information to figure out whether their advertising campaign was really working or not, and if they were um, spending uh, the right amount of money. Like uh, they could figure out the lifetime value of a user, and that would let them figure out if uh, they were spending too much or too too little or just right. On advertising. Now, this information was going to go away, and uh, and the, it put all of the publishers in a state of panic. Um, uh, Facebook was going to, on November 4th, um, change it so that those uh, mobile measurement partners could no longer pass along that device level information. Uh, and that was, that was a, sort of a uh, significant in, in one way in that they uh, they sort of got this um, suggestion back from Facebook verbally that if you give us uh, the rest of your data, um, data on users who came in other means than a Facebook mobile ad, uh, then we would then be able to have enough information to figure out um, your lifetime value. So, Dean, I'm a little surprised that Facebook would even consider doing this because all these game and mobile app publishers, they are on other platforms as well. Facebook's obviously not the only game in town. So, you know, why would Facebook even consider doing this? Because, it, you know, that would give their competitors a, a, a bit of an advantage in terms of uh, mobile data for the publishers. Well, definitely uh, some of the publishers were uh, deciding that Facebook advertising uh, would no longer be worth it to them. They were forced to give up their proprietary data. And so, yes, they would have tried to go to other competitors uh, of Facebook's. But, you know, Facebook has uh, real person data, right? Knows who you are. And that's an advantage it has over a lot of other platforms. So, uh, in, in some ways, the Facebook mobile ads are the most effective ads out there. Uh, and so, those publishers would have taken big risks of uh, possibly losing the, you know, their best advertising channel. Well, it's really interesting because you've been at the forefront of this. I, you, you had the scoop initially that this was, policy was coming. You had the scoop on this one as well. So if you want to follow this story, if you're, especially if you're a, uh, a, a publisher of some kind that uh, is interested in Facebook, you want to follow the story, and you can follow Dean at VentureBeat.com and also on Twitter at Dean Talk. That's D-E-A-N-T-A-K. Dean, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. We reported twice on the Lexus hoverboard, a skateboard that hovers over the ground like the one Marty McFly rode in Back to the Future. Our next guest not only saw the hoverboard in real life, but actually rode it, and he lived to tell about it. Sam Sheffer is a social media manager for The Verge and joins us now. Welcome to the show, Sam. Hello. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Mike. It's a Thank you here. so much for coming on. Now, before we get into your new, your new information in your piece, can you first tell us what it was like to ride the Lexus hoverboard? Did it... Did it uh, feel like you thought it would feel after watching Back to the Future? No. 
<laughs> uh, so I've been skateboarding for over a decade. And when you skateboard, you have four wheels on the ground and it's kind of easy to balance, uh, when you have experience, but the Lexus hoverboard very much was like a tightrope because the magnetic field is directly in the center of the board. So you need to have very good balance. So when I was riding it or riding it, uh, it kept scraping the ground and I was able to maybe go like six or seven feet of gliding, uh, before the board would sort of like hit the ground and I have to like for sort of forced to, to be jumped off. Uh, but it was definitely cool seeing it in person when I first got there, um, they put the board down on the track and were pushing it back and forth over that like patch of water. And I was, it was kind of like a holy crap moment. They like actually did it and it's real and I'm standing in front of it. But riding it was not even close to what it was like in Back to the Future. And I'm not sure we can ever get there. Sam, uh, first of all, my son is very jealous of you because he's a skateboarder <laughs> and he would love to ride this thing. Um, but you mentioned you mentioned specifically that the the Lexus folks put it on a on a track, and I'm not sure people understand how this really works. This is actually a special built, uh, we'll call it a skate park for lack of a better word. But um, can you tell us how uh, how it's built and what's underneath the actual track itself? Because it looks like it's all concrete, like a regular skate park, but clearly it's not. So Lexus's advertising agency did a great job of creating this sort of hover park uh, for the board. Um, what you see him riding on is actually all wood. It's not concrete. And the track is built into the park itself. So every, you know, wherever the rider goes, he is on a track. And the way it works is the board is jam-packed with these superconductors. It is like a four-element combination. It's like ceramic tiles. And when they are cooled down to a critical temperature, which I've been told is negative 180 centigrades, wow. the superconductors exhibit these unique properties, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when uh, sort of when they're in this uh, magnetic field. So the track is filled with magnets in a specially arranged way. And when you super cool uh, the hoverboard on that, like what you're you know sort of showing on the screen right now, it becomes trapped in magnetic fields. Um, and what's interesting is that this tech isn't new. It's been around for like a hundred years. Uh, it's called flux pinning. So again, the superconductors are cooled down. They uh, sort of manipulate the magnetic fields around it and become trapped inside. So the board is cooled down um, and then they bring it onto the track and you have about 15 or 20 minutes depending on the weight of the rider and the heat outside before the liquid nitrogen evaporates and the board does not hover anymore. Now, the, the casual uh, follower of this news uh, might be led down the wrong path, basically thinking that, oh, the, the skateboard is about to be replaced by this amazing new technology, which is being built by Lexus. Lexus is going to sell me my next skateboard and I'll be skating around on a cushion of magnetic air or whatever. And that's not the case at all. In fact, Lexus didn't even build the skateboard, did they? So who built this thing? Who came out with this technology? So the tech itself has been around forever. There are YouTubers that show how superconductors work. Um, pretty sure it was discovered in like 1911 by some scientists. I did a ton of Wikipedia research on this while I was writing the piece. So, so what you're saying uh, is literally that the, the, the hoverboard technology was invented before the skateboard was invented. Uh, more or less, yeah. And then so Lexus, you know, they had their advertising agency get in touch with these scientists from Germany that were working on maglev tech and then had them shift focus to, you know, sort of like they had the idea uh, it was like a year and a half ago they had this idea and they you know, went through a ton of refinements. Lexus actually put out a video yesterday um, on the creation of this thing. Like they have like, it's like all of these days and then it's like day like 360 or whatever and the dude's riding on the thing. Um, so yeah, they, they found some scientists that were doing some awesome stuff and were able to shift focus. And I, I, I do want to sort of say it's cool that Lexus did this and formed a actual hoverboard because in theory, anyone could have done this just using superconductors and magnets, but Lexus went out and did this. So, well, Sam, that actually gets me to my question. I mean, it's not Lexus that built it. It's um, Lexus isn't. Yeah. Gonna, they're not going to sell it. Um, right. So, I mean, is your? I mean, aside from the coolness of the technology and getting a ride on this thing, I mean, is this really a, a way for a, for Lexus to do um, marketing? Basically, is that what this is all about for them? 
so it's part of their amazing in motion campaign. Uh, they had like did they had Will I Am for they did like the, these dancing robots, the the LED light suit, um, and it's it's mostly for Lexus to sort of be like. Hey, person watching this video, we're thinking, you know, in the future, and this is like so cool, and like, you know, buy our cars, we're Lexus, you know. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, they're not making a product, um, and they're, you know, we had the, the so the, there was the Hendo hoverboard that's like kind of real, but it's mega expensive and not really consumer product. It's like if you have a ton of money, buy this thing, and you need a copper floor, and then. The whole the thing with the hover last year, Tony Hawk, the whole funny or die thing. So the internet has been worked so emotionally about the hoverboard. And then when the Lexus video came out, I think the the consensus was, oh snap, like they're doing this, but like, are they gonna release it as a product? And it's not really even clear that uh, Lexus just did this for the ad. You know, they they peddled some sort of hope. Uh, that like it can be done, and yes, they did it. Great, yeah, that's the the track right there. Um, you know, Lexus did it. They built the hoverboard. They built the track. They did the ad. But you and I and no one is getting a hoverboard uh, anytime soon. I'm pretty sure they tore down the park already. And the dream of having a hoverboard that you can just toss and it'll hover on pavement uh, is. I, I mean, nothing is impossible, but, oh, man, I will be very happy if that ever happens in our lifetime. You know, people justify spending on the space program by saying this will inspire a new generation of scientists to blah, blah, blah. So I guess marketing can do the same thing. Maybe there's some 11-year-old kid right now going, someday I'm going to create this, uh, yeah, make everything hover or something like that. And if in, some can figure out how to manipulate the uh, magnetic, uh, you know, sort of like gravity and all the electromagnetism that the earth, you know, gives out on its own. If someone figures that out, great. But until now, it absolutely needs a track to ride on. Well, at the very least, it's got, a, got to have been the best uh, press junket you've ever been on. Did you get a chance to go to Barcelona? I did. That was the first time I was in Europe, too. So that was kind of cool. Yeah, that is cool. But I have to tell you, as somebody who spent a lot of time in Barcelona and Europe, Barcelona is not Europe. It's its own planet. I uh, hope you enjoyed yourself. And uh, thank you so much for coming on today. Sam Sheffer is at TheVerge.com and on Twitter at Sam Sheffer with two Fs. Thank you so yes. much for joining us today, Sam. Thank you for having me, Mike. Take care. Bye-bye. Epson has come out with a new printer called the EcoTank. The signature feature of the printer is that it can go years without needing the ink, ink cartridges replaced. Sounds awesome. Wilson Rothman is personal tech editor for the Wall Street Journal and joins us to talk about it. Welcome, welcome to the show, Wilson. Thanks for having me, Mike. Thank you for coming on again. Now, it's pretty clear why this is a compelling feature. I think we all uh, have frustration about uh, printers and printer ink cartridges. You know, you told a story at the beginning of your piece about running out of ink. Uh, that I think it's a story we can all relate to. Can you tell us that story briefly? Sure, sure. It ended up on uh, Gizmodo at four in the morning, right, right after it, it happened to me. What happened was um, I had a real estate deal, you know, buying a house. I had, you know, about eight hours to turn around this deal, and it was the middle of the night. And I was printing a black and white contract of 15 pages, and I ran out of magenta ink. Now, <laughs> I had magenta ink. I grabbed the new cartridge of magenta ink, and it said that car cartridge is not valid. <laughs> then I restarted it. The, the cartridge worked, but I ran out of yellow ink. Again, trying to pay, print 15 pages of black and white, right? I ran out of yellow ink. I had yellow ink. I tried to put it in. Same thing happened, only I couldn't shake it out of its, its conviction that I was somehow using invalid cartridges. At this time, I was only using Epson cartridges. Um, so after hours of troubleshooting, Googling, which I which I screenshot quite liberally on the on the Gizmodo article back then. Um, I kind of ended up with a profanity laden uh, rant and a trip to Kinkos. <laughs> yeah, Wilson, I don't think uh, I've had a more frustrating uh, consumer electronics experience than with printers, more so than any other devices, for the very reasons that you mentioned. It's DRM cartridges now, and you know you need colored ink to print black and white. It just doesn't make any sense. But so Epson's got a, an answer to this uh, problem. It looks like, and it's called the EcoTank. How does this actually keep printing um, without so needing it, it, cartridges? So Epson has a tech. Their their print technology is basically um, 
No, it's it's permanent really heads. Like so like an HP or a Canon, every time you change a cartridge, you change the print head. But with Epson, the heads are always there. And what you're only changing in your cartridge is an ink reservoir. So instead of having that cartridge with like four drops of ink in it, they've got tubes running out to the side. And then you can see right there, the side of the printer. And that's got a yeah, giant reservoir, uh, four tanks that you fill yourself with these tubes of substantial quantities of ink um, that come right in the box. So you, you know, the first thing you do when you start it up is just squeeze yeah. a lot of ink into each of those tanks and then you let it run for about 15, 20 minutes to prime and then it starts printing and you really don't have any sense of, you know, you can see the levels but you don't really have any sense of where you're at and for a few years or at least a few thousand pages for each, you know, 4,000 uh, plus black and white pages, 6,000 plus color pages. Um, and then, of course, you do eventually run out of ink. But even there, Epson has made the replacement ink a lot more affordable. So a whole set of those giant tubes is 52 bucks, which you can't even get a set of XL cartridges for 52 bucks. And that's about seven times more. So economically, how does this shake out? So, for example, the printer is a lot more expensive than your typical cheap right. printer. Four hundred bucks to start with. Yeah. So, so how does this compare economically in the long run? Is this cheaper, more expensive? Uh, what do you think this is in terms of just a, a raw, you know, dollars and cents uh, perspective? If you, if you buy an Epson printer for sixty to hundred bucks, and you buy Epson ink, you can save between, say. 250 and 400 dollars over the course of two years so epson's argument is it is a substantial savings if you pay 400 up front um, by the way i'm basing all my pricing here on the uh the eps the et2550 which is kind of what i consider to be the ba the basic model equivalent of what you can buy for 60 bucks it's 400 msrp um compared to a hundred dollar msrp printer right now uh that takes cartridges so anyway, so you see, the math really does work if you are someone who only buys Epson print cartridges. But things change if you're someone who, like me, buys the Easy Ink cartridge that comes up on Amazon when I search for my printer. Um, you know, all these cheap ink companies are out there, a lot of them coming from China and other places where you're just, you don't really know what you're getting, but it's so much cheaper. I mean, by a power of 10, that it's not even risky. You know what I mean? Buy it. If it doesn't work, go back to the Epson cartridge. You know what I mean? So, Wilson, I mean, it's clear that Epson's really flipping the model because with the printers, typically, it's it's kind of like the razor and razor blade model. They, they give you the printer yeah. cheap, and then you end up spending a lot more on the replacement ink. So... Epson's clearly done that. They've priced the printer at like $400 and so on, and it lasts much longer, and you replace the ink less. Do you think there's a chance that consumers actually buy into this? Because we're really used to that razor and razor blade model. Well, I think that I think this will open some people's eyes to the the fact that the razor and blade model is actually a, a huge expense. The fact that Epson itself is admitting that it's an enormous expense um, is eye opening. Uh, I I've, I can tell you right now that consumers are going to buy into it at least to some degree because. Our article, my review on this subject, has gone through the roof. You know, people are talking about it. People are emailing. It's it's really got buzz because people were accepting this model, but because it was the only way to do it, they weren't accepting it because it was ideal. Now, people who print photos, things like that, who spend money on ink and and printers because they want precision, they're going to keep doing what they do. But those of us, like, look, I got two kids. I come home. And there's like 50 pages of cat pictures from Google Images <laughs> on the floor, right? I mean, I don't, I don't want to be that guy that puts a padlock on my printer, right? Especially if my kids are doing something other than just sitting there playing games all the time. You know, they're doing something creative and interesting. I want, to, I want that to thrive. I don't want to be the bad guy, you know? It sounds to me like the creative and interesting thing they're doing is changing the number on, under how many copies you want print, changing it to 30 <laughs> Maybe the padlock is a good idea. All right, Wilson Rothman is at WSJ.com and on Twitter at WJ Rothman. Thank you so much for joining us today, Wilson. Thanks a lot, Mike. All right. Facebook today rolled out new options for businesses to provide private customer support.
Their goal is to change the social or business norm of using telephones for how people get tech support or customer service. Starting today, business pages will be able to privately message users who comment on the page's post. So, for example, if you go to company A and you don't like something about that company, you say, oh, you guys are terrible, they can then message you privately through the messaging feature of Facebook uh, because you posted in their area. That didn't used to be the case. It used to be that they could only reply to a message that came to them through the message uh, app. Now, Facebook is also enabling companies to set up canned message uh, messages for replying to users. And here's the best part. Facebook will reward fast replies with a new badge on their page that says, quote, very responsive to messages, unquote. In other words, they're going to sort of let people brag. They're going to brag for them if they're really, uh, uh, you know, responsive. To earn the badge, businesses will have to reply to at least 90% of the messages within five minutes. Kevin Tofel, this is a kind of a radical move, and it's kind of a good move. I think this is kind of brilliant on Facebook's part. But um, my one caveat is I would love to see consumers know that they could either opt in or opt out to those kinds of responses. But that's that's a totally separate animal. Um, from a support standpoint, I, I love having social networks actually put you in touch with support people. I am not a phone user. I, I worked in a call center in a past life. I took 30,000 support calls. I just don't like to use the phone these days. So when I have a problem, I tend to actually go out to Twitter or wherever and say something about a product or a company. And I do get generally good responses. And this is just another way to do that. So I like the idea. This is also part of the larger saga of Facebook taking over the world. They've got everybody's eyeballs. People are spending hours and hours on Facebook. And so why not? Why not become your newspaper, your customer support hotline, your everything, your video site, your everything? And so we're going to see more and more of this uh, leveraging of the, those eyeballs into every type of business that you can imagine. They're adding commerce, for example. You can be shopping on Facebook. So uh, it's really uh, – Facebook is, a, is a, really a company to watch right now. They are really taking over a lot of things, or trying anyway. Uh, we'll see if this actually catches on. And speak of the devil, Facebook yesterday was granted a patent for authorizing and authenticating a user based on their social graph. You're going to love this one, folks. The method does a number of things, but one of them is going to be really controversial. The patent describes a way for Facebook to approve a loan based on the creditworthiness of your family and friends. The idea is that a bank working through Facebook could approve or deny a bank loan based in part on whether or not all the social connections attain a specific average credit score. The patent was applied for by Friendster, and Facebook got it when they acquired that social network five years ago. Kevin Tofel, I think this is going to be super controversial, but I don't think this is anything Facebook is really intending to implement. What do you think? Right. The, you know, granting a, or having a patent granted doesn't necessarily mean it will actually be used in a product. So we have to say that up front. But I really hope it doesn't become one. I mean, personally, I don't know, nor do I want to know the credit scores of my friends on Facebook or my neighbors and such. It's none of my business. I don't really care. But more importantly, it should have no effect on me and my ability to get a loan. I mean, that's my credit, my my own responsibility. So I am not a fan of this ever becoming a, or seeing the light of day. Yeah, me neither. Uh, hopefully it won't, and I don't think it will. Well, we got some more news coming right up, but first let's talk about Gazelle. Gazelle is a place that will buy uh, your old gadget. They will sell you a new one, and uh, it's just a great place for you to do any sort of trading uh, with gadgets. And one of the things that uh, I like to talk about about Gazelle, and I was talking about this, I was writing about this long before I worked at Twit, long before I ever did a Gazelle ad, is the environmental friendliness of getting your device back into circulation. The ugly reality of smartphones, we love them. We love them so much, we need them. But they are really environmentally unfriendly. Everything from the mining of the minerals to the, to the construction of the factories to the actual manufacturing of those uh, devices. There are nasty chemicals and lots of uh, uh, toxic metals involved in smartphones. They're really uh, environmentally unfriendly. And they're, you know, they're Phones that you can buy that claim to be environmentally friendly, but the only environmentally friendly phone that you can that that exists is one that doesn't exist. That one is never manufactured, and by getting a phone back into circulation, back into somebody's hands, so that they don't buy a brand new phone, means that there's theoretically a phone that won't be made, and that is the only way to make phones more environmentally friendly to get more use out of them. So that's why I think that people like you and me who love gadgets, love the latest and greatest 
should just get the latest and greatest and get that older phone back into circulation as fast as you possibly can to get the most life out of it as possible. And the more people who do this sort of thing, the fewer phones will be manufactured. We need to change the way we think about phones and stop buying, you know, for all of us buying a brand new phone. And, and you know, if you sell to Gazelle and buy from Gazelle in every single case, you are not trading in brand new phones. It's not about the phones that are being manufactured initially. And you always want to be able to right-size the phone. You want the best phone you can possibly get for the money, and you're going to get that at Gazelle. That's what you get by going to Gazelle instead of to, you know, your local carrier store or wherever else you're going to get your smartphone. So I highly recommend that you go to Gazelle to buy and also to sell. It's good for the environment. Find out what your iPhone's worth. Take a minute and go to gazelle.com to find out. And we thank Gazelle for their support of Tech News Today. We've got a big number for you today, a surprisingly big number, 28. That's the percentage of patents Google bought from its experimental patent purchase promotion, which we told you about, and which launched in April and ended last week. The program offered to buy patents from anyone at a price set by the patent holder. The lowest price Google paid for patent was $3,000. The highest was $250,000. Kevin Tofel, this program came out of nowhere, came out of left field. They launched it. They said, hey, you know, tell us what patents you want to uh, sell us. I figure there would be 1%, 3%, 5%. 28%, that's more than a quarter of the patents that were offered to them, they actually paid for. Yeah, it makes me wish I had something, uh, some kind of idea that was patented because they bought far more than I would have expected. And as you said, they did it at a price that the patent holder actually put it out there for. So it wasn't like a, any bidding or back and forth, buying, selling. You want to buy the patent, Google? Here's how much it's going to cost. I think it's a very straightforward way of doing things. Google's got tons of money. So, you know, $250,000 somebody got for some patent. Um, it, it makes me wonder, though, does Google really know what it wants to do in the future? It seems like they're always trying new things, but here to actually just say, let's see what kind of patents you guys have. Maybe we'll buy some. It just seems like an odd approach to me. Yeah. And, you know, part of this is uh, what they may want to do in the future. And part of it is just uh, having an arsenal full of stuff that they can go to court with. So for even for technology that they develop themselves or have already developed, you know, they can, you know, they might get sued saying, oh, yeah, we own the patent for, you know, that sort of process. And they can say, oh, wait, here's one that we have. This is the process. And of course, the whole thing is, the whole point of all of this is that the whole system is full of BS. I mean, it, the whole thing is just needs to be completely rewritten because it, it's broken. This is what companies are reduced to, just gobbling up patents just in case they need to go to court someday. It's a, it's a really re, uh, weird world. Um, but still, it's great to see innovation in this area. And um, they're also going to have a lot of sellers of remorse. You know, somebody's going to go and say, oh, uh, I'll sell you this patent for $10,000 and Google, when Google says sold, they're going to say, I could have gotten 20. Darn it. Yeah, that's the, that's the downside of setting your price without, you know, having any room to negotiate. Exactly. So. exactly. Our TNT fan of the day is Ken Lang in Columbia, Missouri, who posted this picture of his office. He says he uses the same setup for watching Tech News Today, TN2, Twiat, Twit, and the new screensavers. And he still has time for work. Look at that. Look at that desk. I think that's the tidiest, neatest, most well-organized desk I've ever seen in my life, Kevin. I wish my desk looked like that, but it yeah. does not, I guarantee you. Yeah, unbelievable. Very nice. Well done. Well, show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google+, Plus, Twitter, or Facebook, and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. Kevin Tofel, what are you working on these days? Uh, over at ZDNet, uh, later this week, you'll see that review of the Moto X that I uh, started using last week on this show, actually. Nice. And... Uh, I'll cut to, cut to the chase right now for the uh, Tech News Today listeners. If you're looking for a nice smartphone, Android, and you don't have much more than $200 to spend off contract, go buy this phone. It's fantastic for the price. Uh, fantastic camera, the same sensor as the Nexus 6. Good battery life, very responsive, and it really, really surprised me how well it's built for a uh, starting price of $179. Dang it, you give me Android MV. Uh, it looks <laughs> like you got the grape-flavored uh, backplate. I didn't get a choice. This is this is what they gave me. It's like a magenta, yeah, like soft rubberized, nice and nice grip. Actually, feels yeah. good, curved. I, I love that in a in a device. You know, of course, the iPhone six is like a wet bar of soap. It's like you, if you don't have a case, you're dropping it. Uh, mm -hmm. That's just how it is. And there are a lot of Android phones that are like that too. But uh, I love those rubberized backs. Well, Kevin Tofel, thank you so much for coming today, and we'll see you next week. Sounds great. Thank you. All right. Bye bye.
You can subscribe to Tech News Today on iTunes, or you can choose any way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. If you'd like to help us grow our audience, here's how to do it. Just post a link to twit.tv slash TNT on your favorite social media site, tag three friends, and recommend that they subscribe. You can also subscribe to our subreddit at technewstoday.reddit.com, and you can follow me at elgin.com. Don't miss our other news show, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. Today's guest is iMore Editor-in-Chief Renee Ritchie. Take a shot every time he says Apple Watch. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tech News Today. This show is produced by Jason Cleanthes and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.